This is Twit. Corey uh, is beside. I mean, I guess first and foremost, a writer. I mean, uh, according to Wikipedia, yeah. you started selling fiction when you were seventeen. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're also an activist. Uh, yeah. Served for four years as a European Affairs Coordinator for the EFF. Um, you spoke at the Hope Conference last July. I imagine you'll be doing that again soon. Um, mm -hmm. So you're an activist in the in the real world. One of the things that I I you know in previous books. Uh, you've done, uh, you've made them cr Creative Commons and a kind of open mm -hmm. source. This one is not. Yeah. Tell me about that. So the reasoning for Creative Commons was really threefold. Uh, one was that um, I felt that in a world in which it really only takes one click to get a book for free, whether or not it's been CC'd, that I wanted to find a way to incentivize people to voluntarily buy the book. That, the, that all payments are fundamentally voluntary because you could just take the book for free if you didn't feel like paying for it and it's no one would ever catch you. Right. And, you know, that, that seems like pretty obvious to anyone who uses the internet. Um, and one was that I wanted people to understand that all of the things that I do when I write, which is to take other works and, you know, file their serial numbers off and mash them up <laughs> and make new works out of them, that that was part of the legitimate tradition and one was that I really wanted to make sure that people enjoyed the full range of freedoms that came with print books. You know, I have books on these shelves that are books that I've taken with me back and forth across the ocean as I move from Canada to Central America to San Francisco to London, back to, to L.A., back to London, now back to L.A. again. And, you know, books that came to me through my father, books that came to me through dear friends, books that I bought used, books that I bought new, books that are, you know, hundreds of years old. Here's one of my favorites is the old uh, Punch. Uh, oh, man, you know, I Punch subscribed magazine. to that when I was a kid. Uh, when I was yeah. a teenager, I loved Punch. So, you know, 19th century awesome. art literature. And that, you know, we have this beautiful old tradition of books that when I say old, I mean like not just older than, you know, modern publishing, but like older than copyright and printing right. uh, that um, has with a set of rights that go to book owners that are separate from the set of rights that go to publishers or writers. And that by fiat in the, with the advent of the digital book, five publishers declared that 7,000 years of norms around ownership of books have been wiped off the slate and that now we had a new deal where you were a licensor of the book and that your rights were totally constrained. And I think CC is an amazing way to signal that. My publisher Doesn't over time became... the same way. <laughs> well, they became less patient with CC right. uh, and my views about it. And in particular, it was really hampering my... Um, foreign agents' ability to sell my books right. overseas. Right. Uh, that was um, because with my publisher, I could sit down and, and talk it through with them and get them kind of on board. But, you know, with my Italian publisher, my French publisher, my German publisher, I'm not in the room, right? This is my agents, foreign sub-agents going to Bologna, going to Frankfurt, these big book fairs, and selling to the one very fluent English speaker from that publisher who's come to negotiate with the all the English language editors. And, you know, expecting these guys who are selling this catalog, this binder of hundreds of English language writers to, in that 25-minute meeting with someone from a big publisher from Portugal, to get into CC with them was unrealistic. Yeah. And so it's not that it didn't happen, but it, it ended up with a lot of confusion and a lot of, you know, firefighting and whatnot. Even like and Paolo I, Coelho couldn't, that that, ex, that ex, example wasn't enough to, to kind of open yeah, their eyes Yeah, it to just that. wasn't. Yeah. But what, it, what, what I came to realize was that there were other ways to accomplish these goals. I could continue to use CC for independently published work I, and, and for my, my, my uh, personally published work. So, you know, I write between five and 20 short essays, some of them very substantial on Boing Boing every day, all of them CC'd. I do that five to seven days a week and have done it for 15 years. So it's not like I don't continue to publish on uh, under Creative Commons. I just have changed, you know, one corner of what I work in uh, in terms of its relationship to CC. And I still am a great believer in CC, but, you know, there are these other ways of expressing these preferences. So for one thing, all of my publishers are DRM free and that's not something I'm ever gonna waver on. Uh, you mentioned that I used to work for EFF. I'm actually back at EFF. I've been back now for about a year and a half. 
as a, um, a special consultant on a on a single project called Apollo 1201, whose ten uh, year mission is to kill all the DRM in the world forever. Nice. <laughs> uh, and so, all my books are DRM free, and that means that um, you don't if you violate the license terms that are imposed because of stupid licensing things. The, there is um, no automatic mechanism for enforcement against you. You do get, uh, it, it's, it, you know, the thing about DRM is that breaking DRM is itself an offense with no fair use defense that the courts have found so far. And so if you have to break DRM in order to exercise your fair use, you are already in trouble. No DRM, you get to argue for your rights. So I get to claw that back. And in terms of fair use, uh, and in terms of the other uses you might make of the work, um, CC is nice, and it's nice to have some like affirmative element where the writer intervenes and says, I affirm that these rights that have been yours in copyright and by common tradition for thousands of years are still yours, but we shouldn't be de de depending on the voluntary surrendering of these ridiculous rights grabs in order to get there. You know, our poll star shouldn't be voluntary licensing it should be the unassailable, inalienable right of the reader to remix, to to you know continue in this literary tradition the way I have, the way other writers always have. And so for me, my poll star is like Supreme Court cases like The Wind Ungone, where the Margaret Mitchell estate sued the author of a retelling of uh, Gone with the Wind from the perspective of the enslaved people. And the Supreme Court found that taking all the characters and all the plot elements and using them in a new transformative way, even if the author objected, was not uh, an offense. That copyright allowed that, that that was part of the free expression uh, bargain in, in copyright. And so, uh, I, you know, it's kind of a tautology that the authors who don't mind if you don't re remix their books don't mind if you remix their books. What I'm interested in is what about the authors who do mind in a way that hobbles free speech? That's the really that's the sharp issue, right? Not not the not the woke, cool, hip writers who are like down with remix. It's the it's the whole world of re, of material that we've always historically remixed, whose uh, remixability has been compromised by these new norms. And CC is great for allowing people to push back against those norms, but it it should be the the floor on what we remix and not the ceiling. And so the way I reconciled myself to this and, and discussing it with my publisher was by asserting that we could um, uh, talk very publicly about the rights of people to remix. We could have no DRM. And then finally, that I could field my own ebook store that was DRM free oh. that uh, would make me a retailer for my books so that um, even with the books that are CC licensed, you can choose to pay for them. And with the books that aren't CC licensed, well, you know, you still have a choice because you can go and get them for free somewhere else on the internet. So you can choose to pay zero. And in my ideal world, you could choose to pay a, a number that was between zero and full fare. But, you know, the world is an imperfect place. And at the very least, what I can do is give you a way to buy those books with no licensing terms. So when you buy that book for me, the license is you can do the things copyright lets you do and you can't do the things copyright forbids. And that's uh, that's the full entire license spectrum. You don't have to waive your rights to walk in the door of my ebook store. And you know, I get a lot of email from people who are like, "I like your books, but I don't want to give money to Jeff Bezos or some other big company. How do I do that?" Well, you buy them for me. I remit to my publisher, and so you pay uh, a royalty back to the publisher. In yeah, yeah. So I get that's the retail split off the top. I get the thirty percent retail split off the top, and I get the twenty-five percent retail split off the back end. It's almost fifty percent, which is not coincidentally. It's what the Authors Guild thinks we should be getting for our ebooks. So it's a way to get right. the money that the Authors Guild, who are often quite reactionary about copyright and ebooks, it's a thing that we can agree on and right. a way to make it happen without, you know. Asking the publishers to change the standard deal for ebook royalties, which, like, they would rather drink a warm jug of spit every morning <laughs> for breakfast than change the standard deal. But this is a way to give my my readers an uh, uh, an identical ebook, but to do it through uh, a mechanism that I control that allows me to also sell into every territory. So I have a different publisher in the U.S. and the U.K. Right. You go to the wrong website. You know, not if you're in the U.S. and the U.K., but maybe if you're in Canada, you'll guess the wrong website. And Amazon U.S. will just say, 
uh, well, Amazon UK in the case of Canada would say just buzz off. You're not allowed to buy this book, right? Well, like if you're sitting there with your money in your hand, I want to take your money. And so I can sell into every territory. I figure out based on where you live, who gets the remittance from my publisher. And so you don't have to figure out what my Baroque commercial arrangements are in order to read my books, which is also a thing we've never asked people to do no, in the yes. world of print books. Yeah. So it takes a lot of the dumb, inefficient, crappy stuff about buying ebooks and it throws it away and it replaces it with something that is foundationally fair, that uh, allows the writer and the reader to have a stronger relationship and that um, ensures that the reader's rights are intact. And so where Creative Commons was a way for me to uh, incentivize people to believe that they were getting a fair deal when they, when they got my books, this is a way to do that, too, that keeps me and my publisher and my agent all working uh, with the same set of incentives and the same alignment. And, you know, I d you, you were showing me earlier that you have my um, self-published uh, ebook collection or uh, short story collection there yeah. with a little help. Yeah. And I, you know, I self-published that that short story collection. I made I uh, to a first approximation about thirty thousand dollars on it, which is about what I would make if I had done it with a traditional publisher. So right. I can definitely make as much money. No, I make a lot more from novels. I make, you know, without like naming numbers, an order of magnitude more than that, easily with novels. Interesting. But, um, Interesting. But it took an enormous amount of work to make that book happen. Absolutely, and that was yeah. a time that I did not spend writing other books. Right. And so after doing that, you know, if I had made 10 X that, if I'd made 300 grand on a short story collection that I self published, I would have said, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to tithe 10 or 15% of my writing time from now on to being a self publisher. But I, I didn't. Right. And I think I was well situated to have, to have done that. And I failed to, and not that the experiment was a failure, but that it showed me, that I could better spend my time working with a publisher who specializes in getting my books in front of my audience, with an agent who can bring that book to publishers I would never meet all over the world. And that the that combination was so powerful and gets my books read by so many more people and gives me so much more time to write that it made sense for me to find a way to publish that aligned all of our incentives. And I do regret that it's not CC licensed. Like, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but I also feel... Like I'm accomplishing many of the same equities that I'd hoped for, and that the you know that what I'm not going to get into is the, that that was one of my great impetuses for getting into CC licenses is I'm not going to get into a situation where my artistic business model or my copyrights become an excuse for more internet censorship, more internet surveillance, where someone sues a fan or an innovator because of my copyrights. That's never going to be part of the calculus because of the way that I've constructed the rest of my publishing business, even without CC. And uh, yeah, I, I, the, the reason I asked you, I wanted to find out how you felt if, if you felt that these experiments had failed or, and now this makes a lot of sense. You, you know, you want to lead, you want to create change, but you can't lead the parade so fast that they're left behind and you're marching alone <laughs> around the corner. So yeah. you, you got to bring people along with you. And sometimes they don't move at the speed we all like, but that's fine. Have you ever sat down with talk to somebody like Ursula K. Le Guin and, and, and tried to persuade her of your point of view? You know, I did have a conversation like that with Ursula and it didn't end well. Yeah. And I think <laughs> she has been uh, quite angry at me ever since. She's one of the yeah. most vocal authors yeah. guild uh, proponents. It makes me a bit sad because I'm an enormous fan of her work and I wish that we could see eye to eye on this. I, I think maybe if we had a longer talk, it would have worked out better, but it, it, it actually went very poorly. Uh, I have had this talk with other authors who um, uh, ha we've been very cordial and it's ended well and I think we both learned from each other. A good example of that from the Authors Guild is James Glick. Uh, who wrote Chaos Making of a New Science Love and James the Information yeah. and his new book is the t um, Time Travel book. He is a wonderful, wonderful writer. And he and I, w we have a lot of common ground. Um, and, you know, a lot of what he sees uh, as copyrights benefit is from a kind of labor management split. And I think that there, that he's right, that one of the great tools we have in terms of copyrights enforceability uh, is a uh, a club with which we on the supply side can beat the intermediaries like our publishers with. And that, um, that, that tool can be very useful to us. And, you know, this reminds me of like when I was a baby writer, you know, all the writers I met when I was coming up told me that copyright was the most important thing and that any copyright I surrendered 
was something that would be used to beat me up by my publishers. And they're right that copyright is a useful tool to mediate my relationship with my publishers, but it doesn't make it a useful tool to mediate my relationship with my audience. Um, and, you know, you have never had to know a single solitary thing about copyright to read, lend, share a book, right? That, that, and, and if we believe that we are going to somehow get the entire reading public to give the tiniest little crap about our weird esoteric industrial regulation <laughs> as a condition of being entertained by us, yeah, we are sadly mistaken, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and like, we can't, right? Because yeah. copyright is this super recondite technical set of rules for, um, you know, this very complicated industry with a lot of moving parts. And the idea that you could like build a copyright system that was on the one hand, like complicated, technical and nuanced enough that Universal could use it when they licensed Harry Potter from Warner and built the Universal Harry Potter theme park that's around the corner from me here. But that like a kid in her mom's basement around the corner from me here could use those same rules to navigate her Harry Potter fanfic. It's ridiculous. Right. You know, even if she were like the Doogie Hauser of law and got a JD at 12, <laughs> no one at Warner's is going to answer the phone when she calls them up for a license. Right. They got better things to do with their time. And so, you know, that is just like it's a stupid fairy tale. We tell ourselves that someday we'll use copyright to mediate our relationships with our audience. And that doesn't mean that we won't have some rules and they may not they may even be legal rules. Right. Mostly they're normative rules, the things that readers and, and writers use to mediate their relationships. You know, Stephen Bruce says telling a writer he wrote a bad book is like telling him he's got an ugly kid. Even if uh, it's true, he's done everything he could to prevent it. And it's too late now. So we have lots of normative rules about what we should do, writers and readers. Uh, but, but the idea that we'll use the same framework that we use as an industry is like wrong on its face and totally bonkers.